Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. I have the uh, perfect skies behind me. Can't find a better image to start the baseball season uh, with Don Moeller, but with spring and with things happening, and we've tried to support the arts as best we can. Before I get to this segment, though, uh, I'm about to set up a green screen here in the studio, and I won't be able to wear my green El Guapo shirt anymore, so I want to give a shout-out to our sponsors at El Guapo and, of course, State Fair, where they tried to force those chicken and waffles upon me and the shrimp and grits the other day, but I did opt for the twin uh, black and chicken breast with the crab meat and the Brussels sprouts. It was unbelievable. Get over to State fair i stopped at fadley's before the final four this weekend grabbed the crab cake and a double order of mac and cheese i even a little curbsided for chris pica over there as well fadley's order those crab cakes ship them to you and our friends at wise markets always having wise conversations don amazing things going on when this came to your desk and my desk we not only wanted to, to support avam and our friends right on the other side of Federal Hill, two blocks from where I live, with an event this week. But this really spoke to you and I as, hmm, music, the KKK, keep, you know, fixing the world, making, healing the world, bringing love together. And, you know, I have a nice, loud, artsy love shirt that I can wear today. I'm going to let you – this is tying all sorts of things together, Don. Well, you, you and I love uh, Rebecca Hofberger and all things American Visionary Arts Museum. And when Helen Wynn reached out to me to tell me about our guest who was going to be part of a big virtual conference that they have coming up uh, Sunday, uh, April the 11th. And she began to tell me the story. I just said, stop, 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 stop. This is a Baltimore yeah. positive segment. Yeah. You, you had me at hello, right? You had me at hello. So a well-known musician and uh, Daryl Davis, the way I described, I was trying to think, Daryl, Ku Klux Klan outreach activists. I thought this is about what somebody tells me that an African American male, motivated, I guess, by wanting to make the world a better place, made it his life's mission to reach out and have conversation with Klan members. Welcome to Baltimore Positive. And do I have that right? Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much right. You're well, a tough you... one to sort of, you know, introduce in that <laughs> way, right? Because, I mean, we could go down the whole realm of Boogie Woogie Piano and Chuck Berry and Jerry Lee. We could do all of that. But, uh, you well, know, Well, you know, it actually started with that. Well, there you go. You know, right. it actually started with that. I was um, I was performing in a uh, in a bar called the Silver Dollar Lounge up in Frederick, Maryland. And uh, back then, the Silver Dollar Lounge was what was called and, you know, known to be an all-white bar, not meaning that Blacks could not go in, but Blacks did not go in by their own choice. Because, you know, when you go somewhere where you're not welcome and alcohol is being served, <laughs> it's not a good combination. Yeah, what time are we talking about here? What time frame? This you was 19, the 50s, right? 1983. Oh, my goodness. Okay, I'm in high school. Don and I knew each other. There you the go. Time. There okay. you go. Yeah. All, right. All right. So uh, I was playing with a country a country band, you know, country music had made a resurgence. Uh, that movie uh, Urban Cowboy had been out, you know, and oh, yeah. all the bars and clubs changed to country music. Everybody it was riding electric bull. Exactly. The it, yeah, the electric bull and line dances, you know, and Deborah all that. Deborah Winger and, and uh, John Travolta. There exactly. we go. Exactly. Mickey, Gil Mickey Gilly. How about that? Yeah, Mr. Gillies. Mickey yeah. Gilly. Pass it to so, Texas. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, uh, the, the country band was pretty established in the area. And I had just joined them. I was the only black guy in the band. And uh, they'd played there before and my, my first time in there. So we had just finished a set of music and I came off the bandstand. I'm following the band to the band table, sit down. When I felt somebody come up from behind me and put their arm around my shoulder. Now, you know, I don't know anybody in this joint. So I'm turning around to see who's touching me. As this a white guy, maybe 15, 18 years older than me, big smile on his face. And he says, man, I sure like your piano playing. And I thanked him and shook his hand. And then he says, you know, this is the first time I've ever seen a, a black man play piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. And, uh, you know, I was not offended, but I was surprised that he did not know the black origin of Jerry Lee Lewis's style of piano playing. And I proceeded to explain to him that, uh, that both Jerry Lee and I were influenced by the same black blues and boogie woogie piano players. That's where rock and roll and rockabilly evolved. Well, he did not believe in the black origin you know, of, of Jerry Lee's style. 
And I said, look, man, I said, I know Jerry Lee Lewis. He's a very good friend of mine. You know, he's told me himself. Well, he didn't believe I knew Jerry Lee either, but he was so fascinated. He wanted to invite me back to his table to have a drink with him. So I went back to his table. I don't drink, but I uh, had a cranberry juice with him. And then he took his glass and he clinks my glass and cheers me and says, you know, this is the first time I ever sat down and had a drink with a black man. And you know, now I'm, I'm like completely mystified because at that point in my life, I had sat down literally with thousands of white people or anybody else and had a meal, a beverage, a conversation. How was it this, this guy had never done it? And I asked him why. And he stared down at the tabletop and didn't answer me. And I asked him again. And his buddy sitting next to him elbowed him and said, tell him, tell him, tell him. And I said, tell me. And he looked back at me and said, I'm a member of the Ku Klux Klan. I burst out laughing at the guy, you know, because I didn't believe him. You know, I know a lot about the Klan and I know they don't just come up and embrace some black guy and want to hang out and buy him a drink. So I'm laughing. He goes inside his pocket, pulls out his wallet and hands me his Klan membership card. I look at this thing. I said, whoa, I recognize the Klan insignia, which is a red circle with a white cross and a red blood drop in the center of the cross. This thing was for real. So I stopped laughing and I gave it back to him. But, you know, he was very, very friendly. Uh, very fascinated by me or something. And we talked and uh, he gave me his phone number, wanted me to call him whenever I was to return to this bar so he could bring his friends, you know, the ones with the pointed hats and the, and the robes um, to see the black man who plays like Jerry Lee. That's how he referred to me. And I'd call him every six weeks whenever the band was, you know, to reappear there. I'd call him on a Wednesday or a Thursday and say, hey man, you know, we're playing down at the Silver Dollar this weekend, come on out. He'd come. Can I ask you, Daryl, are you the only, uh, in 1983, are there five black men that walk in there a year as a musician, or are you the only at that point? I mean, I always try to get along this line, because I met Don in 1982 at Dundalk High School, and, and you know, and, and Don I can Don tell you was, about Dundalk, too. I played the Old Mill Tavern. I can tell you about that place, too, buddy. Well, <laughs> Nestor will want to You don't even want to know. <laughs> Huh? Well, no, Nestor will want to know. Well, I will <laughs> want to know because, uh, you know, I, I grew up in a place that, you know, it was certainly segregated, I, as I would call it as an adult, that I never would have known why all the kids from Turner sat in one corner at the lunchroom, right? Like, uh -huh. I, I'm now 52 years old trying right. to examine all of these things that just felt normal at the time, but certainly were not normal. Right. So that's why when I ask you – the difference between stories I hear in the 60s in the South and something in Frederick in 1983, and I think to myself, well, I saw concerts in Frederick in the late 80s because, you know, bands would play out there in the Hairspray era. The, yeah. You know, Hammerjacks. I was the music critic. At I played the Hammerjacks, too. Sure. Sure, right? So, you know, on that circuit, I'm just thinking how often you walked into a bar in a country band being a black man and wondered, like, if you were safe that night in 1983 or whether this was an outlier to you. No, uh, th there were there were a number of places like that, you know. Um, well, you pointed that out. You already called out Dundalk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, it was not uncommon, I would think. Not exactly. talked about much. Certainly, right. I didn't hear about it in 1983. We were watching MTV and thought the Michael Jackson and Prince and the world was all cool, right? And, and, and Michael Jackson was the first black person to play on MTV and one of the very few initially. Yeah, well, I've watched the documentaries 30 years later about how all of that went down, right? And uh -huh. uh, you know, that, that's why I'm asking about your experience in 83 as to how it would paint your experience of the world it, in, in the silver silver dollar is that what it was called yeah silver dollar lounge yeah so so daryl you meet this gentleman you're playing jerry lee he likes jerry lee you you give him some history of jerry lee you sit down you have a cranberry he has a bourbon he shows you his clan card and says i'm gonna bring some of my buddies the other clan guys back <laughs> when you're playing again it's like oh okay pick i mean some of the guests we have, there's, there, and I know there's a documentary associated with this, which I now can't wait to watch. I mean, it, 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 it's got to be a remarkable uh, documentary. So take us from that moment. You have this chance encounter with a Klansman in Frederick. How does this become really part of your life's mission? Okay, so to understand that part, we got to go back before, uh, back to my childhood. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the child of parents in the, in the U.S. Foreign Service. So I grew up around the world as an American embassy brat. 
you know, traveling to different countries every two years living there. And now as a professional musician, I travel around the world again. Well, <clears throat> I had come back, you know, when, when I was in class overseas in school, starting in 1961, at the age of three, I began traveling. And, and um, played a piano apparently too. No, I wasn't playing piano back then. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, my classes were filled with kids from all over the world. You know, uh, anybody who had an embassy in those countries, all their kids went to the same school. So my classroom looked like a United Nations of little kids, precisely. And uh, when I would come back home after my dad's two year assignment, I would either be in all black schools or black and white schools, meaning the still segregated or the newly integrated. And there was not the amount of diversity in my classroom that I had overseas. So literally when I was overseas, I was living about 10 years ahead of my time because that multicultural environment had yet to come to the US. Today is here, of course, you go to any city school, people from, every, you know, from everywhere, but that was not the case in the 1960s. So one of the times we came back, uh, I knew nothing about racism, nothing, because I got along with people from all over the world. So one time we came back, I was age 10 in fourth grade, 1968, and <clears throat> we were in Belmont, Massachusetts. I was one of two black kids in the entire school, myself in fourth grade, a little black girl in second grade. So consequently, all of my friends were white, fourth and fifth graders. Uh, many of my male friends were members of the Cub Scouts and they invited me to join. So I joined and we had a parade from Lexington to Concord, Massachusetts, which is right next door to Belmont to uh, commemorate the ride of Paul Revere. Uh, girl Scouts, Brownies, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, 4-H Club, um, I got the tipping point. I'm reading the tipping point. <laughs> there you go. And I, I wrote about Paul Revere last night. Like, there you go. Damien O'Donnell. Serendipity. Serendipity. That's the way it works around here. Yeah. So uh, I'm the only black participant, and we're marching. Everybody's waving and cheering and yelling, the British are coming. We got to one point uh, in this parade route when all of a sudden, bam, I'm getting hit with uh, bottles and soda pop cans and, and small rocks by just a small group of spectators off to my right. And uh, I didn't understand it. I thought, you know, those people over there didn't like the scouts. I didn't realize I was the only scout getting hit until my, my uh, troop leaders all came running and huddled over me with their bodies and escorted me out of the danger. And I didn't know why, you know, what had I, what had I done? I kept saying, why are they doing that to me? I, I didn't do anything. And uh, they kept, you know, shushing me and rushing me along, telling me everything will be okay, just keep moving, keep moving. So at the end of the day, when I went home, my mom and dad, who were not present at the parade, were fixing me up, putting band-aids on me and getting me all cleaned up and asking me, how did I fall down and get all scraped up? And I told them I didn't fall down. I told them what had happened. Somebody threw things at me. For the first time in my life, my parents sat me down and explained to me what racism was. I had never even heard the word. You know, I had no reason to until and you're now. how old, Daryl? You're how old, Daryl? Ten. 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 Yeah. And this could so, not possibly make any sense to you, right? It, my 10 year old brain could not process it because the people on the sidewalk did not look any different to me than my friends at school or whether I was overseas, my little French friends, my little German friends, Australian friends, Swedish friends. You know, so it had nothing to do with the color of my skin. My parents were lying to me. Why they were lying, I had no clue, but they were lying because people do, you know, do not do things like that. So I did not believe my folks. Well, guess what? About a month and a half, two months later, that same year, 1968, on April the 4th, which, is, yeah, which was yesterday, right? Uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And I remember it just like it was yesterday. Every major city in this country, nearby Boston, where I am right now, right near Washington, DC, where you are, Baltimore, my hometown, Chicago, Los Angeles, every major city burned to the ground in the name of this new word I had learned called racism. So now I understood my parents had told me the truth. This, this phenomenon does exist, but I didn't know why. why. Why do people not like somebody because of their skin color? So at that age, I formed a question in my mind, which was, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? And now for the next 52 years, 53 years, I have been looking for the answer to that question. So, you know, when I would ask people, I said, oh, Daryl, you know, that's just the way it is. Some people are just like that. Well, why? That, well, they couldn't explain it. So after that incident with the Klan, it didn't dawn on me that night 
but much time had passed because I I had left that band and going back to playing rock and roll and stuff. And then a while later, it dawned on me, Daryl, the answer to your question that has been plaguing you since the age of 10, how can you hate me when you don't even know me, fell right into your lap. Who better to ask that question of than someone who would go so far as to join an organization that has a, over a hundred year history of practicing hating people who don't look like them or who don't believe as they believe. Get back in contact with that guy and uh, get him to fix you up with the Klan leader here in Maryland and then travel around the country interviewing Klan leaders and members and write a book because no book had been written about the Klan by a black author. My book became the first. So that's right, how so it we're gonna, I, I mean, it's this begs the question. Daryl Davis uh, joining us here. He will be with uh, at the American Visionary Arts this weekend, telling stories about love. I'm wearing my love shirt. You can let everybody down there know we're back. Everybody, we're going to be back in there soon, hopefully, uh, loving up all the art. So let's go back to Frederick in 1983, because I'm I'm a little stunned because I hear of these stories in the 60s, and they feel black and white, and they feel Martin Luther King era. They don't feel they feel much more real to me in 1983. So you have a cranberry. This gentleman leaves to go back to his clan life for six more weeks. You go tinkle the ivories and other places and you're playing your country music and you come back. So mm -hmm. we'll, please, please pick that part of the story up. Okay, so I would call the guy and I'd say, hey man, you know, we'll be down at the uh, Silver Dollar Lounge this week and come on out. I called him on a Wednesday or Thursday. And so he'd come out both nights, Friday and Saturday, he would bring clan members, clansmen and clanswomen. Now, you know, they came in regular clothes, not in their robes and hoods. And uh, they, would watch, they would gather around the stage and watch me play. They'd get out on the dance floor and dance to our music. And then on the bricks, you know, I would make my way over to his table to say hello. Some of the people at the table would hang there. They were curious about me. They wanted to talk to me, meet me or whatever. And others would like get up and, you know, they see me coming, they get up and scurry across the room to some other area. So, you know, the message was implied that, you know, we don't want to touch you. We don't want to talk to you. We just want to look at you. So that was fine. You know, they could, they could go, you know, wherever they wanted to go. And I would sit there and talk with him and some of the ones, you know, that hung there. And this went on until the end of that year. And I went back to playing rock and roll. But so some years later, I contacted him. I got in touch with him and, um, and got him to fix me up with the Klan leader in Maryland. A state leader is known as a grand dragon. Uh, like, you know, you and I would call that person a governor. A national leader is known as an imperial wizard, which you and I would call a president. So uh, he, he reluctantly gave me the, the information to contact the Grand Dragon of Maryland on the condition that I not tell the Grand Dragon where I got his information. So I agreed. And Are these warned, people hiding at this point, hiding in plain sight to some degree? Uh, you know, a lot of them hide in plain sight. Uh, normally the leaders... Uh, they don't hide in plain sight because they are the face of their organization. But others, you know, they have good jobs. You know, I know people who work at Safeway. I know people who work at the phone company who work as correction officers. Some even work in the police department. You know, uh, uh, one of the Grand Dragons, I, I own his robe and hood and his police uniform. He was a Baltimore City cop. I'm not talking about undercover cop in the Klan. I'm talking about bona fide Klansmen on the Baltimore City police force. Well, how did you, you know, <laughs> boy, Nestor, this may be the first- Time of, out, we gotta take another segment. Yeah, take a this break. may be the back. first of many, many it's part one conversations. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's true, Nestor. We may, we may wanna take a quick pause here uh, and come back for segment two, because this thing's obviously gonna run over. There's so much to talk about. Well, yeah, fair enough. Let's do that. And uh, Daryl Davis is here. Stay with us, Daryl. Uh, yeah, right. yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll be back for more right after this on Baltimore Positive.